The Burning of Rome Under Nero, AD 64, by Heinrich Sienkiewicz, Part 1. Sienkiewicz and Tacitus. Nero, when a youth, was placed under charge of the philosopher Seneca, who carefully attended to his education. During Nero's nonage, he was persevering in his studies and made great progress in Greek. By a subterfuge of his mother's, he was proclaimed emperor in the place of Britannicus, the real heir to the throne. In the early part of his reign, public affairs were wisely conducted, but the private life of Nero was given up to vice and profligacy. His love for Poppaea led him into the crime of matricide, for she, wishing to share the imperial throne, and knowing it was impossible while his mother, Agrippina, lived, induced him to authorize her assassination. Strange that Seneca and Burrus should have approved of this, yet Tacitus admits that such was the case. In the eighth year of his reign, Nero divorced his wife, Octavia, and married Poppaea. Nero was an accomplished musician and sang verses composed by himself. He eagerly sought the plaudits of the multitude by reciting his compositions in public. Historians are divided in opinion as to whether Nero was the cause of the burning of Rome. During the conflagration, to court popularity, he ordered temporary shelters to be provided for the houseless. Yet the people did not acclaim this deed, as it was reported that Nero, at the very time Rome was in flames, sang the destruction of Troy in his private theater, likening the present disaster to that ancient catastrophe. In order to divert the masses from what they believed the true origin of the fire, Nero charged it upon the Christians, many hundreds of whom were sacrificed to his fury. He was the last of the Caesars and died by his own hand amid universal execrations in June AD 68, four years after the destruction of Rome. Heinrich Sinkowitz. The fire began at the Circus Maximus in that section which touches the Palatine and Caelian Hill. It rushed on with inconceivable rapidity and fastened upon the whole center of Rome. Since the time of Brennus, never had the city witnessed such an awful catastrophe. A freedman of Caesar's, Phaon by name, ran panting into Nero's presence, shrieking, Rome is in flames, the conflagration is great. All Caesar's guests arose from their recumbent attitude. Ye gods, I shall see a burning city. Now can I finish the Troyadi? exclaimed Nero, placing his loot aside. If I go at once, can I view the fire? My lord, the whole city is as a sea of flame. The smoke is suffocatingly heavy and is destroying the people. The inhabitants faint away or rashly cast themselves into the fire, maddened with terror. All Rome perishes. And Nero raised his hands and cried, Woe, woe to thee, thou sacred city of Priam. Fires were frequent enough in Rome. During these conflagrations, violence and robbery were rampant, particularly so in those sections of the city inhabited by needy half-barbarian peoples, a folk comprising rabble from every part of the world. The fear of servile rebellion was like a nightmare, which had stifled Rome for many years. It was believed that hundreds of thousands of those people were thinking of the times of Spartacus, and merely waiting for a favorable moment to seize arms against their oppressors and Rome. Now the moment had come. Perhaps war and slaughter were raging in the city together with fire. It was possible even that the Praetorians had hurled themselves on the city and were slaughtering at command of Caesar. And that moment the hair rose on Winicius's head from terror. He recalled all the conversations about burning cities which for some time had been repeated at Caesar's court with wonderful persistence. Well, he recalled Caesar's complaints that he was forced to describe a burning city without having seen an actual fire. His contemptuous answer to Tigellinus, who offered to burn Antium or an artificial wooden city. Finally, his complaints against Rome and the pestilential alleys of the Sabura. Yes, truly Caesar has commanded the burning of the city. Only he could give such a command, as Tigellinus alone could accomplish it. But if Rome is burning at command of Caesar, who can be sure that the population will not be slaughtered at his command? The monster is capable of just such a deed. Conflagration, a servile revolt, and slaughter. What a horrible chaos. What a letting loose of destructive elements and horrid universal frenzy. The night had paled long since. The dawn had passed into light. And on all the nearer summits golden, rosy gleams were shining, which might come either from burning Rome or the rising daylight. When Icius ran to the hill, the summit was reached, and then a terrible sight struck his eyes. All the lower region was covered with smoke, forming, as it were, 
one gigantic cloud lying close to the earth. In this cloud, towns, aqueducts, villas, trees disappeared. But farther beyond this gray, ghastly plain, the city was burning on the hills. The conflagration had not the form of a pillar of fire, as happens when a single building is burning, even when of the greatest size. That was a long belt, rather, shaped like the belt of dawn. Above this belt rose a wave of smoke, in places entirely black, in places looking rose-colored, in places like blood, in places turning in on itself, in some places inflated, in others squeezed and squirming, like a serpent which is unwinding and extending. That monstrous wave seemed at times to cover even the belt of fire, which became then as narrow as a ribbon, but later this ribbon illuminated the smoke from beneath, changing its lower rolls into waves of flame. The two extended from one side of the sky to the other, hiding its lower part, as at times a stretch of forest hides the horizon. The Sabine Hills were not visible in the least. It seemed at the first glance of the eye that not only the city was burning, but the whole world, and that no living being could save itself from that ocean of flame and smoke. The wind blew with increasing strength from the region of the fire, bringing the smell of burnt things and of smoke, which began to hide even nearer objects. Clear daylight had come, and the sun lighted up the summits surrounding the Alban Lake. But the bright golden rays of the morning appeared reddish and sickly through the haze. Winicius, while descending toward Albanum, entered smoke which was denser, less and less transparent. The town itself was buried in it thoroughly. The alarmed citizens had moved out to the street. It was a terror to think of what might be in Rome when it was difficult to breathe in Albanum. He met increasing numbers of people who had deserted the city and were going to the Alban Hills. They had escaped the fire and wished to go beyond the line of smoke. Before he had reached Oosternum, he had to slacken his pace because of the throng. Besides pedestrians with bundles on their backs, he met horses with packs, mules and vehicles laden with effects, and finally litters in which slaves were bearing the wealthier citizens. The town of Oosternum was so thronged with fugitives from Rome that it was difficult to push through the crowd. On the market square, under temple porticos, and on the streets were swarms of fugitives. Here and there people were erecting tents under which whole families were to find shelter. Others settled down under the naked sky, shouting, calling on the gods, or cursing the fates. In the general terror, it was difficult to inquire about anything. New crowds of men, women, and children arrived from the direction of Rome every moment. These increased the disorder and outcry. Some, gone astray in the throng, sought desperately those whom they had lost. Others fought for a camping place. Half-crazy shepherds from the Campania crowded to the town to hear news, or find profit in plunder made easy by the uproar. Here and there, crowds of slaves of every nationality and gladiators fell to robbing houses and villas in the town, and to fighting with the soldiers who appeared in defense of the citizens. Junius, a friend of Winicius, said, after a moment's hesitation, in a low voice, I know that thou wilt not betray me, so I will tell thee that this is no common fire. People were not permitted to save the circus. When houses began to burn in every direction, I myself heard thousands of voices exclaiming, Death to those who save. Certain people ran through the city and hurled burning torches into buildings. On the other hand, people are revolting and crying that the city is burning at command. I can say nothing more. Woe to the city, woe to us all and to me. The tongue of man cannot tell what is happening there. People are perishing in flames or slaying one another in the throng. This is the end of Rome. Winicius, nearing the walls, found it easier to reach Rome than penetrate to the middle of the city. It was difficult to push along the Apian Way because of the throng of people. Houses, cemeteries, fields, gardens, and temples lying on both sides of it were turned into camping places. In the Temple of Mars, which stood near the Porta Appia, the crowd had thrown down the doors so as to find a refuge within during night hours. In the cemeteries, the larger monuments were seized and battles fought in defense of them, which were carried to bloodshed. Oosternum, with its disorder, gave barely a slight foretaste of that which was happening beneath the walls of the capital. All regard for the dignity of law, for family ties, for difference of position, had ceased. Gladiators drunk with wine seized in the emporium, gathered in crowds and ran with wild shouts through the neighboring squares, 
trampling, scattering, and robbing the people. A multitude of barbarian slaves, exposed for sale in the city, escaped from the booths. For them, the burning and ruin of Rome were at once the end of slavery and the hour of revenge, so that when the permanent inhabitants, who had lost all they owned in the fire, stretched their hands to the gods in despair, calling for rescue, these slaves with howls of delight scattered the crowds, dragged clothing from people's backs, and bore away the younger women. They were joined by other slaves serving in the city from of old, wretches who had nothing on their bodies save woolen girdles around their hips, dreadful figures from the alleys who were hardly ever seen on the streets in the daytime, and whose existence in Rome it was difficult to suspect. Men of this wild and unrestrained crowd, Asiatics, Africans, Greeks, Thracians, Germans, Britons, howling in every language of the earth, raged, thinking that the hour had come in which they were free to reward themselves for years of misery and suffering. In the midst of that surging throng of humanity, in the glitter of day and of fire, shone the helmets of Praetorians, under whose protection the more peaceable population had taken refuge, and who in hand-to-hand -hand battle had to meet the raging multitude in many places. Winicius had seen captured cities, but never had his eyes beheld a spectacle in which despair, tears, pain, groans, wild delight, madness, rage, and license were mingled together in such immeasurable chaos. Above this heaving, mad human multitude roared the fire, surging up to the hilltops of the greatest city on earth, sending into the whirling throng its fiery breath and covering it with smoke, through which it was impossible to see the blue sky. The young tribune, with supreme effort and exposing his life every moment, forced his way at last to the Apian Gate, but there he saw that he could not reach the city through the division of the Porta Capina, not merely because of the throng, but also because of the terrible heat from which the whole atmosphere was quivering inside the gate. Besides, the bridge at the Porta Trigenia, opposite the temple of the Bona Dea, did not exist yet. Hence, those who wished to go beyond the Tiber had to pass through to the Pons Sublicius, that is, to pass around the Aventine through a part of the city covered now with one sea of flame. That was an impossibility. Winicius understood that he must return toward Ustrinum, turn from the Apian Way, cross the river below the city, and go to the Via Portuensis, which led straight to the Trans-Tiber. That was not easy because of the increasing disorder on the Apian Way. At the Fountain of Mercury, however, he saw a centurion who was known to him. This man, at the head of a few tens of soldiers, was defending the precinct of the temple. He commanded him to follow. Recognizing a tribune and an Augustian, the centurion did not dare to disobey the order. He and his men were followed by curses and a shower of stones, but to these he gave no heed, caring only to reach freer spaces at the earliest. Still he advanced with the greatest effort. People who had encamped would not move, and heaped loud curses on Caesar and the Praetorians. The throng assumed in places a threatening aspect. Thousands of voices accused Nero of burning the city. He and Popea were threatened with death. Shouts of buffoon, actor, matricide were heard round about. Some shouted to drag him to the Tiber, others that Rome had shown patience enough. It was clear that where a leader found, these threats could be changed into open rebellion which might break out any moment. Meanwhile, the rage and despair of the crowd turned against the Praetorians, who for another reason could not make their way out of the crowd. The road was blocked by piles of goods, born from the fire previously, boxes, barrels of provisions, furniture the most costly, vessels, infants' cradles, beds, carts, hand packs. Here and there they fought hand to hand, but the Praetorians conquered the weaponless multitude easily. After they had ridden with difficulty across the Vi Latina, Numidia, Ardia, Lavinia, and Ostia, and passed around villas, gardens, cemeteries, and temples, Winicius reached at last a village called Vicus Alexandri, beyond which he crossed the Tiber. There was more open space at this spot and less smoke. From fugitives, of whom there was no lack even there, he learned that only certain alleys of the Trans-Tiber were burning, but that surely nothing could resist the fury of the conflagration, since people were spreading the fire purposely and permitted no one to quench it, declaring that they acted at command. The young tribune had not the least doubt then that Caesar had given command to burn Rome, and the vengeance which people demanded seemed to him just and proper. 
What more could Mithridates or any of Rome's most inveterate enemies have done? The measure had been exceeded. His madness had grown to be too enormous, and the existence of people too difficult because of him. All believed that Nero's hour had struck, that those ruins into which the city was falling should and must overwhelm the monstrous buffoon together with all those crimes of his. Should a man be found of courage sufficient to stand at the head of the despairing people, that might happen in a few hours. Here vengeful and daring thoughts began to fly through his head. But if he should do that, the family of Winicius, which till recent times counted a whole series of consuls, was known throughout Rome. The crowds needed only a name. Once, when 400 slaves of the prefect Padanius Secundus were sentenced, Rome reached the verge of rebellion and civil war. What would happen today in view of a dreadful calamity surpassing almost everything which Rome had undergone in the course of eight centuries? Whoever calls the Curates to arms, thought Winicius, will overthrow Nero undoubtedly and clothe himself in purple. The trans Tiber was full of smoke, and crowds of fugitives made it more difficult to reach the interior of the place, since people, having more time there, had saved greater quantities of goods. The main street itself was in many parts filled completely, and around the Numachia Augusta great heaps were piled up. Narrow alleys, in which smoke had collected more densely, were simply impassable. The inhabitants were fleeing in thousands. On the way, Winicius saw wonderful sights. More than once, two rivers of people, flowing in opposite directions, met in a narrow passage, stopped each other, men fought hand to hand, struck and trampled one another. Families lost one another in the uproar. Mothers called on their children despairingly. The young tribune's hair stood on end at thought of what must happen nearer the fire. Amid shouts and howls, it was difficult to inquire about anything or understand what was said. At times, new columns of smoke from beyond the river rolled toward them. Smoke black and so heavy that it moved near the ground, hiding houses, people, and every object, just as night does. The fervor of a July day, increased by the heat of the burning parts of the city, became unendurable. Smoke pained the eyes, breath failed in men's breasts. Even the inhabitants who, hoping that the fire would not cross the river, had remained in their houses so far, began to leave them, and the throng increased hourly. The Praetorians accompanying Winicius were in the rear. In the crush, someone wounded his horse with a hammer. The beast threw up its bloody head, reared, and refused obedience. The crowd recognized in Winicius an Augustian by his rich tunic, and at once cries were raised round about. Death to Nero and his incendiaries. This was a moment of terrible danger. Hundreds of hands were stretched toward Winicius, but his frightened horse bore him away, trampling people as he went, and the next moment a new wave of black smoke rolled in and filled the street with darkness. Winicius, seeing that he could not ride past, sprang to the earth and rushed forward on foot, slipping along walls and at times waiting till the fleeing multitude passed him. He said to himself in spirit that these were vain efforts. At times he stopped and rubbed his eyes. Tearing off the edge of his tunic, he covered his nose and mouth with it and ran on. As he approached the river, the heat increased terribly. Winicius, knowing that the fire had begun at the Circus Maximus, thought at first that that heat came from its cinders and from the Forum Boarium and the Wellabrum, which, situated nearby, must be also in flames. But the heat was growing unendurable. One old man, on crutches and fleeing, the last whom Winicius noticed, cried, Go not near the bridge of Cestius, the whole island is on fire. It was indeed impossible to be deceived any longer. At the turn toward the weakest Judeorum, the young tribune saw flames amid clouds of smoke. Not only the island was burning, but the trans Tiber and the other end of the street on which he ran. The Burning of Rome Under Nero AD 64 by Henrik Sienkiewicz Part 2 The thunder of the flames was more terrible than the roar of wild beasts and the hour had come now in which he must think of his own safety. For the river of fire was flowing nearer and nearer from the direction of the island, and rolls of smoke covered the alley almost completely. The taper which he carried was quenched from the current of air. Venetius rushed to the street and ran at full speed toward the Via Portuensis whence he had come. 
The fire seemed to pursue him with burning breath, now surrounding him with fresh clouds of smoke, now covering him with sparks, which fell on his hair, neck and clothing. The tunic began to smolder on him in places. He cared not but ran forward, lest he might be stifled from smoke. He had the taste of soot and burning in his mouth. His throat and lungs were as if on fire. The blood rushed to his head, and at moments all things, even the smoke itself, seemed red to him. Then he thought, this is living fire, better throw myself upon the ground and quickly perish. The running tortured him more and more. His head, neck and shoulders were streaming with sweat, which scalded like boiling water. But he ran on as if drunk, staggering from one side of the street to the other. Meanwhile something changed in that monstrous conflagration which had embraced the giant city. Everything which till then had only glimmered burst forth visibly into one sea of flame. The wind had ceased to bring smoke. That smoke, which had collected in the streets, was borne away by a mad whirl of heated air. That whirl drove with it millions of sparks, so that Vinicius was running in a fiery cloud, as it were. But he was able to see before him all the better, and in a moment, almost when he was ready to fall, he saw the end of the street. That sight gave him fresh strength. Passing the corner, he found himself in a street, which led to the Via Portuensis and the Codetan field. The sparks ceased to drive him. He understood that if he could run to the Via Portuensis, he was safe, even were he to faint on it. At the end of the street he saw again a cloud, as it seemed, which stopped the exit. If that is smoke, thought he, I cannot pass. He ran with a remnant of his strength. On the way he threw off his tunic, which, on fire from the sparks, was burning him like the shirt of Nessus, having only a capitium around his head and before his mouth. When he had run farther, he saw that what he had taken for smoke was dust, from which rose a multitude of cries and voices. The rubble are plundering houses, thought Venetius, but he ran toward the voices. In any case, people were there, they might assist him. In this hope, he shouted for aid with all his might before he reached them. But this was his last effort. It grew redder, still in his eyes. Breath failed his lungs, strength failed his bones, he fell. They heard him, however, or rather saw him. Two men ran with gourds full of water. Vinicius, who had fallen from exhaustion, but had not lost consciousness, seized the gourd with both hands and emptied one half of it. Thanks, said he, place me on my feet. I can walk on alone. The other laborer poured water on his head. The two not only placed him on his feet, but raised him from the ground and carried him to the others, who surrounded him and asked if he had suffered seriously. This tenderness astonished Venetius. People, who are ye? asked he. We are breaking down houses so that the fire may not reach the Via Portuensis, answered one of the laborers. Ye come to my aid when I had fallen. Thanks to you. We are not permitted to refuse aid, answered a number of voices. Vinicius, who from early morning had seen brutal crowds slaying and robbing, looked with more attention on the faces around him and said, May Christ reward you. Praise to his name, 
exclaimed the whole chorus of voices. It was evening, but one could see as in daylight, for the conflagration had increased. It seemed that not single parts of the city were burning, but the whole city through the length and the breadth of it. The sky was dread as far as the eye could see it, and that night in the world was a red night. The light from the burning city filled the sky as far as human eye could reach. The moon rose large and full from behind the mountains, and, inflamed at once by the glare, took on the color of heated brass. It seemed to look with amazement on the world-ruling city which was perishing. In the rose-colored abysses of heaven, rose-colored stars were glittering. But in distinction from usual nights, the earth was brighter than the heavens. Rome, like a giant pile, illuminated the whole Campania. In the bloody light were seen distant mountains, towns, villas, temples, monuments, and the aqueducts stretching toward the city from all the adjacent hills. On the aqueducts were swarms of people who had gathered there for safety or to gaze at the burning. Meanwhile, the dreadful element was embracing new divisions of the city. It was impossible to doubt that criminal hands were spreading the fire, since new conflagrations were breaking out all the time, in places remote from the principal fire. From the heights on which Rome was founded, the flames flowed like waves of the sea into the valleys densely occupied by houses, houses of five and six stories, full of shops, booths, movable wooden amphitheaters, built to accommodate various spectacles, and finally storehouses of wood, olives, grain, nuts, pine cones, the kernels of which nourished the more needy population, and clothing, which, through Caesar's favor, was distributed from time to time among the rubble huddled into narrow alleys. In those places the fire, finding abundance of inflammable materials, became almost a series of explosions, and took possessions of whole streets with unheard of rapidity. People encamping outside the city were standing on the aqueducts, knew from the color of the flame what was burning. The furious power of the wind carried forth from the fiery gulf thousands and millions of burning shells of walnuts and almonds, which, shooting suddenly into the sky, like countless flocks of bright butterflies, burst with a crackling or, driven by the wind, fell in other parts of the city, on aqueducts and fields beyond Rome. All thought of rescue seemed out of place. Confusion increased every moment, for, on one side, the population of the city was fleeing through every gate to places outside. On the other, the fire had lured in thousands of people from the neighborhood such as dwellers in small towns, peasants, and half-wild shepherds of the Campania brought in by hope of plunder. The shout, Rome is perishing, did not leave the lips of the crowd. The ruin of the city seemed at that time to end every rule and loosen all bonds which hitherto had joined people in a single integrity. The mob, in which slaves were more numerous, cared nothing for the lordship of Rome. Destruction of the city could only free them. Hence, here and there, they assumed a threatening attitude. Violence and robbery were extending. It seemed that only the spectacle of the perishing city arrested attention and restrained for the moment an outburst of slaughter, which would begin as soon as the city was turned into ruins. Hundreds of thousands of slaves, forgetting that Rome 
besides temples and walls, possessed some tens of legions in all parts of the world, appeared merely waiting for a watchword and a leader. People began to mention the name of Spartacus, but Spartacus was not alive. Meanwhile, citizens assembled and armed themselves, each with what he could. The most monstrous reports were current at all the gates. Some declared that Vulcan, commanded by Jupiter, was destroying the city with fire from beneath the earth. Others that Vesta was taking vengeance for Rubria. People with these convictions did not care to save anything, but besieging the temples implored mercy of the gods. It was repeated most generally, however, that Caesar had given command to burn Rome, so as to free himself from orders which rose from the Subura, and build a new city under the name of Neronia. Rage seized the populace at the thought of this, and if, as Venetius believed, a leader had taken advantage of that outburst of hatred, Nero's hour would have struck whole years before it did. It was said also that Caesar had gone mad, that he would command Praetorians and gladiators to fall upon the people and make a general slaughter. Others swore by the gods that wild beasts had been let out of all the Vivaria at Bronzebeard's command. Men had seen on the streets lions with burning manes and mad elephants and bisons trampling down people in crowds. There was even some truth in this, for in certain places elephants, at the sight of the approaching fire, had burst the vivaria, and gaining their freedom rushed away from the fire in wild fright, destroying everything before them like a tempest. Public report estimated at tens of thousands the number of persons who had perished in the conflagration. In truth, a great number had perished. There were people who, losing all their property, or those dearest their hearts, threw themselves willingly into the flames from despair. Others were suffocated by smoke. In the middle of the city, between the capital on one side, and the Quirinal, the Viminal and the Esquiline on the other, as also between the Palatine and the Cilian Hill, where the streets were most densely occupied, the fire began in so many places at once that whole crowds of people, while fleeing in one direction, struck unexpectedly on a new wall of fire in front of them, and died a dreadful death in a deluge of flame. In terror, in destruction and bewilderment, people knew not where to flee. The streets were obstructed with goods, and in many narrow places were simply closed. Those who took refuge in those markets and squares of the city, where the Flavian amphitheater stood afterward, near the Temple of the Earth, near the Portico of Silvia, and higher up at the temples of Juno and Lucinia, between the Clivus Viribius and the old Esquiline Gate, perished from heat, surrounded by a sea of fire. In places not reached by the flames, were found afterward hundreds of bodies, burned to a crisp, though here and there unfortunates tore up flat stones and half buried themselves in defense against the heat. Hardly a family inhabiting the center of the city survived in full. Hence, along the walls, at the gates, on all roads were heard howls of despairing women calling on their dear names of those who had perished in the throng or the fire. And so, while some were imploring the gods, others blasphemed them because of this awful catastrophe. 
old men were seen coming from the temple of Jupiter Liberator, stretching forth their hands and crying, If thou be a liberator, save thy altars and the city. But despair turned mainly against the old Roman gods, who, in the minds of the populace, were bound to watch over the city more carefully than others. They had proved themselves powerless, hence were insulted. On the other hand, it happened on the Via Asinaria that when a company of Egyptian priests appeared conducting a statue of Isis, which they had saved from the temple near the Porta Selimontana, a crowd of people rushed among the priests, attached themselves to the chariot, which they drew to the Appian Gate, and seizing the statue, placed it in the Temple of Mars, overwhelming the priests of that deity who dared to resist them. In other places, people invoked Serapis, Baal or Jehovah, whose adherents, swarming out of the alleys in the neighborhood of the Subura and the Trans-Tiber, filled with shouts and uproar the fields near the walls. In their cries were heard tones as if of triumph. When, therefore, some of the citizens joined the chorus and glorified the Lord of the world, others, indignant at this glad shouting, strove to repress it by violence. Here and there hymns were heard, sung by men in the bloom of life, by old men, by women and children. Hymns wonderful and solemn, whose meaning they understood not, but in which were repeated from moment to moment the words, Behold, the judge cometh in the day of wrath and disaster. Thus, this deluge of restless and sleepless people encircled the burning city like a tempest-driven sea. But neither despair, nor blasphemy, nor hymn helped in any way. The destruction seemed as irresistible, perfect and pitiless as predestination itself. Around Pompeii's amphitheater, stores of hemp caught fire, and ropes used in circuses, arenas and every kind of machine at the games, and with them the adjoining buildings containing barrels of pitch with which ropes were smeared. In a few hours, all that part of the city beyond which lay the Campus Martius was so lighted by bright yellow flames that for a time it seemed to the spectators, only half conscious from terror, that in the general ruin the order of night and day had been lost, and that they were looking at sunshine. But later a monstrous bloody gleam extinguished all other colors of flame, from the sea of fire shot up to the heated sky, gigantic fountains and pillars of flame spreading at their summits into fiery branches and feathers. Then the wind bore them away, turned them into golden threads, into hair, into sparks, and swept them on over the Campania toward the Alban hills. The night became brighter, the air itself seemed penetrated, not only with light, but with flame. The Tiber flowed on as living fire. The hapless city was turned into one pandemonium. The conflagration seized more and more space, took hills by storm, flooded level places, drowned valleys, raged, roared and thundered. The city burned on. The Circus Maximus had fallen in ruins. Entire streets and alleys, in part which began to burn first, were falling in turn. After every fall, pillars of flame rose for a time to the very sky. The wind had changed and blew now with mighty force from the sea, bearing toward the Celian, the Esquiline and the Viminal rivers of flame, brands and cinders. Still, the authorities provided for rescue. At command of Tigellinus, who had hastened from Antium the third day before, 
houses on the Esquiline were torn down, so that the fire, reaching empty spaces, died of itself. That was, however, undertaken solely to save a remnant of the city. To save that which was burning was not to be thought of. There was need also to guard against further results of the ruin. Incalculable wealth had perished in Rome. All the property of its citizens had vanished. Hundreds of thousands of people were wandering in utter want outside the walls. Hunger had begun to pinch this throng the second day, for the immense stores of provisions in the city had burned with it. In the universal disorder and in the destruction of authority, no one had thought of furnishing new supplies. Only after the arrival of Tigellinus were proper orders sent to Ostia. But meanwhile, the people had grown more threatening. Besides flour, as much baked bread as possible was brought at his command, not only from Ostia, but from all towns and neighboring villages. When the first installment came at night to the Emporium, the people broke the chief gate toward the Aventine, seized all supplies in the twinkle of an eye, and caused terrible disturbance. In the light of the conflagration, they fought for loaves, and trampled many of them into the earth. Flour from torn bags whitened like snow the whole space, from the granary to the arches of Drusus and Germanicus. The uproar continued till soldiers seized the building and dispersed the crowd with arrows and missiles. Never since the invasion by the Gauls under Brennus had Rome beheld such disaster. People in despair compared the two conflagrations, but in the time of Brennus the capital remained. Now the capital was encircled by a dreadful wreath of flame. The marbles, it is true, were not blazing, but at night, when the wind swept the flames aside for a moment, rows of columns in the lofty sanctuary of Jove were visible, red as glowing coals. In the days of Brennus, moreover, Rome had a disciplined, integral people, attached to the city and its altars, but now crowds of many-tongued populace roamed, nomad-like, around the walls of burning Rome, people composed for the greater part of slaves and freedmen, excited, disorderly and ready, under the pressure of want, to turn against authority and the city. But the very immensity of the fire which terrified every heart disarmed the crowd in a certain measure. After fire might come famine and disease. And to complete the misfortune, the terrible heat of July had appeared. It was impossible to breathe air inflamed both by fire and the sun. Night brought no relief. On the contrary, it presented a hell. During daylight an awful and ominous spectacle met the eye. In the center, a giant city on heights was turned into a roaring volcano. Round about, as far as the Alban hills, was one boundless camp, formed of sheds, tents, huts, vehicles, bales, packs, stands, fires, and all covered with smoke and dust, lighted by sun rays reddened by passing through smoke. Everything filled with roars, shouts, threats, hatred, and terror, a monstrous swarm of men, women, and children. Mingled with queerites were Greeks, shaggy men from the north with blue eyes, Africans and Asiatics. Among citizens were slaves, freedmen, gladiators, merchants, mechanics, servants and soldiers. 
a real sea of people flowing around the island of fire. Various reports move this sea as wind does a real one. These reports were favorable and unfavorable. People told of immense supplies of wheat and clothing to be brought to the Emporium and distributed gratis. It was said too that provinces in Asia and Africa would be stripped of their wealth at Caesar's command and the treasures thus gained to be given to the inhabitants of Rome so that each man might build his own dwelling. But it was noised about also that water in the aqueducts had been poisoned, that Nero intended to annihilate the city, destroy the inhabitants to the last person, then move to Greece or to Egypt and rule the world from a new place. Each report ran with lightning speed, and each found belief among the rubble, causing outbursts of hope anger, terror, or rage. Finally, a kind of fever mastered those nomadic thousands. The belief of Christians that the end of the world by fire was at hand spread even among adherents of gods and extended daily. People fell into torpor or madness. In clouds lighted by the burning, gods were seen gazing down on the ruin. Hands were stretched towards those gods, then to implore pity or send them curses. Meanwhile, soldiers aided by a certain number of inhabitants continued to tear down houses on the Esquiline and the Cilian, as also in the Trans-Tiber. These divisions were saved, therefore, in a considerable part. But in the city itself, were destroyed incalculable treasures accumulated through centuries of conquest. Priceless works of art, splendid temples, the most precious monuments of Rome's past and Rome's glory. They foresaw that of all Rome there would remain barely a few parts on the edges, and that hundreds of thousands of people would be without a roof. Some spread reports that the soldiers were tearing down houses not to stop the fire, but to prevent any part of the city from being saved. Tigellinus sent courier after courier to Antium, imploring Caesar in each letter to come and calm the despairing people with his presence. But Nero moved only when fire had seized the Domus Transitoria, and he hurried so as not to miss the moment in which the conflagration should be at its highest. Meanwhile, fire had reached the Via Nomentana, but turned from it at once with a change of wind toward the Via Lata and the Tiber. It surrounded the capital, spread along the Forum Boarium, destroyed everything which it had spared before and approached the Palatine a second time. Tigellinus, assembling all the Praetorian forces, dispatched courier after courier to Caesar, with an announcement that he would lose nothing of the grandeur of the spectacle, for the fire had increased. But Nero, who was on the road, wished to come at night, so as to sate himself all the better with a view of the perishing capital. Therefore he halted in the neighborhood of Aqua Albana and, summoning to his tent the tragedian Aliturus, decided with his aid on posture, look and expression. Learn fitting gestures, disputing with the actor stubbornly whether at the words, O oh, sacred city, which seemed more enduring than Ida. He was to raise both hands, or, holding in one the forminga, drop it by his side, and raise only the other. This question seemed to him then more important than all others. Starting at last about nightfall, 
he took counsel of Petronius, also weather to the lines describing the catastrophe. He might add a few magnificent blasphemies against the gods, and whether considered from the standpoint of art, they would not have rushed spontaneously from the mouth of a man in such a position, a man who was losing his birthplace. At length he approached the walls about midnight with his numerous court, composed of whole detachments of nobles, senators, knights, freedmen, slaves, women and children. Sixteen thousand Praetorians, arranged in line of battle, along the road, guarded the peace and safety of his entrance, and held the excited populace at a proper distance. The people cursed, shouted and hissed on seeing the retinue, but dared not attack it. In many places, however, applause was given by the rabble which, owning nothing, had lost nothing in the fire, and which hoped for a more bountiful distribution than usual of wheat, olives, clothing and money. Finally, shouts, hissing and applause were drowned in the blare of horns and trumpets, which Tigellinus had caused to be sounded. Nero, on arriving at the Ostian gate, halted and said, Houseless ruler of houseless people, where shall I lay my unfortunate head for the night? After he had passed the Clivus Delphini, he ascended the Appian aqueduct on steps prepared purposely. After him followed the Augustians and the choir of singers, bearing cithare, lutes and other musical instruments. And all held the breaths in their breasts, waiting to learn if he would say some great words, which for their own safety they ought to remember. But he stood solemn, silent, in a purple mantle, and a wreath of golden laurels, gazing at the raging might of the flames. When Terpnos gave him a golden lute, he raised his eyes to the sky, filled with conflagration, as if he were waiting for inspiration. The people pointed at him from afar, as he stood in the bloody gleam. In the distance, fiery serpents were hissing. The ancient and most sacred edifices were in flames. The temple of Hercules, reared by Evander, was burning. The temple of Jupiter Stator was burning. The temple of Luna, built by Servius Tullius, the house of Numa Pompilius, the sanctuary of Vesta with the penates of the Roman people. Through waving flames the capital appeared at intervals. The past and the spirit of Rome were burning. But Caesar was there with the lute in his hand and the theatrical expression on his face, not thinking of his perishing country but of his posture and the prophetic words with which he might describe best the greatness of the catastrophe, rouse most admiration and receive the warmest plaudits. He detested that city, he detested its inhabitants, he loved only his own songs and verses. Hence he rejoiced in heart that at last he saw a tragedy like that which he was writing. The poet was happy, the declaimer felt inspired, the seeker for emotions was delighted at the awful sight, and thought with rapture that even the destruction of Troy was as nothing, if compared with the destruction of that giant city. What more could he desire? There was world-ruling Rome in flames, and he, Standing on the arches of the aqueduct with a golden lute, conspicuous, purple, admired, magnificent and poetic. Down below, somewhere in the darkness, the people are muttering and storming. Let them mutter. Ages will elapse, thousands of years will pass, 
but mankind will remember and glorify the poet who that night sung the fall and the burning of Troy. What was Homer compared with him? What Apollo himself with his hollowed out lute? Here he raised his hands and striking the strings with an exaggerated theatrical gesture pronounced the words of Priam. O oh, nest of my fathers, O oh, dear cradle. His voice in the open air with the roar of the conflagration and the distant murmur of crowding thousands seemed marvelously weak, uncertain and low, and the sound of the accompaniment like the buzzing of insects. But senators, dignitaries and Augustians assembled on the aqueduct bowed their heads and listened in silent rapture. He sang long and his motive was ever sadder. At moments when he stopped to catch breath, the chorus of singers repeated the last verse. Then Nero cast the tragic Sirma from his shoulder with a gesture learned from Aliturus, struck the lute and sang on. When he had finished the lines composed, he improvised, using grandiose comparisons in the spectacle unfolded before him. His face began to change. He was not moved, it is true, by the destruction of his country's capital, but he was delighted and moved with the pathos of his own words to such a degree that his eyes filled with tears on a sudden. At last he dropped the lute to his feet with a clatter and, wrapping himself in the Sirma, stood as petrified, like one of those statues of Niobe, which ornamented the courtyard of the Palatine. Soon a storm of applause broke the silence, but in the distance this was answered by the howling of multitudes. No one doubted then that Caesar had given command to burn the city so as to afford himself a spectacle and sing a song at it. The Burning of Rome Under Nero, A.D. 64, by Tacitus There followed a dreadful disaster. Whether fortuitously or by the wicked contrivance of the prince is not determined, for both are asserted by historians. But of all the calamities which ever befell this city from the rage of fire, this was the most terrible and severe. It broke out in that part of the circus which is contiguous to Mounts Palatine and Cilius, where, by reason of shops in which were kept such goods as minister element to fire, the moment it commenced it acquired strength, and being accelerated by the wind, it spread at once through the whole extent of the circus, for neither were the houses secured by enclosures, nor the temples environed with walls, nor was there any other obstacle to intercept its progress. But the flame, spreading every way impetuously, invaded first the lower regions of the city, then mounted to the higher, then again ravaging the lower. It baffled every effort to extinguish it, by the rapidity of its destructive course and from the liability of the city to conflagration in consequence of the narrow and intricate alleys and the irregularity of the streets in ancient Rome. Add to this the wailings of terrified women, the infirm condition of the aged, and the helplessness of childhood, such as strove to provide for themselves and those who labored to assist others these dragging the feeble, those waiting for them, some hurrying, others lingering, altogether created a scene of universal confusion and embarrassment, and while they looked back upon the danger in their rear, they often found themselves beset before and on their sides, or, if they had escaped into the quarters adjoining, these two were already seized by the devouring flames, even the parts which they believed remote and exempt were found to be in the same distress. At last, not knowing what to shun or where to seek sanctuary, 
they crowded the streets and lay along in the open fields. Some, from the loss of their whole substance, even the means of their daily sustenance, others from affection for their relations whom they had not been able to snatch from the flames, suffer themselves to perish in them, though they had opportunity to escape. Neither dared any man offer to check the fire, so repeated were the menaces of many who forbade to extinguish it, and because others openly threw firebrands with loud declarations that they had one who authorized them, whether they did it that they might plunder with the less restraint or in consequence of orders given. Nero, who was at that juncture sojourning at Antium, did not return to the city till the fire approached that quarter of his house which connected the palace with the gardens of Messinus. Nor could it, however, be prevented from devouring the house and palace and everything around. But, for the relief of the people, thus destitute and driven from their dwellings, he opened the field of Mars and the monumental edifices erected by Agrippa, and even his own gardens. He likewise reared temporary houses for the reception of the forlorn multitude, and from Ostia and the neighboring cities were brought up the river household necessaries, and the price of grain was reduced to three sesterces the measure. All which proceedings, though of a popular character, were thrown away, because a rumor had become universally current that at the very time when the city was in flames, Nero, going on the stage of his private theater, sang the destruction of Troy, assimilating the present disaster to that catastrophe of ancient times. At length, on the sixth day, the conflagration was stayed at the foot of Esquilier by pulling down an immense quantity of buildings, so that an open space and, as it were, void air might check the raging element by breaking the continuity. But ere the consternation had subsided, the fire broke out afresh, with no little violence, but in regions more spacious, and therefore with less destruction of human life. But more extensive havoc was made of the temples and the porticos dedicated to amusement. This conflagration, too, was the subject of more censorious remark, as it arose in the Emilian possessions of Tigellinus, and Nero seemed to aim at the glory of building a new city and calling it by his own name, for, of the fourteen sections into which Rome is divided, four were still standing entire, three were leveled with the ground, and in the seven others there remained, only here and there, a few remnants of houses, shattered and half-consumed. It were no very easy task to recount the number of tenements and temples which were lost, but the following, most venerable for antiquity and sanctity, were consumed. That dedicated by Servius Tullius to the moon. The temple and great altar consecrated by Evander the Arcadian to Hercules while present. The chapel vowed by Romulus to Jupiter Stator. The palace of Numa with the temple of Vesta and in it the tutelar gods of Rome. Moreover, the treasures accumulated by so many victories, the beautiful productions of Greek artists, ancient writings of authors celebrated for genius, until then preserved entire, were consumed. And though great was the beauty of the city in its renovated form, the older inhabitants remembered many decorations of the ancient which could not be replaced in the modern city. There were some who remarked that the commencement of this fire showed itself on the 14th before the calends of July, the day in which the Senon set fire to the captured city. Others carried their investigation so far as to determine that an equal number of years, months, and days intervened between the two fires. To proceed, Nero appropriated to his own purposes the ruins of his country, and founded upon them a palace, in which the old-fashioned and, in those luxurious times, common ornaments of gold and precious stones were not so much the object of attraction as lands and lakes. In one part 
woods like vast deserts. In another part, open spaces and expansive prospects. The projectors and superintendents of this plan were Severus and Seller, men of such ingenuity and daring enterprise as to attempt to conquer by art the obstacles of nature and fool away the treasures of the prince. They had even undertaken to sink a navigable canal from the lake of Vernus to the mouth of the Tiber, over an arid shore or through opposing mountains. Nor, indeed, does there occur anything of a humid nature for supplying water except the Pomptine marshes. The rest is either craggy rock or parched soil. And had it even been possible to break through these obstructions, the toil had been intolerable and disproportioned to the object. Nero, however, who longed to achieve things that exceeded credibility, exerted all his might to perforate the mountains adjoining to Avernus, and to this day there remain traces of his abortive project. But the rest of the old site, not occupied by his palace, was laid out, not as after the Gallic fire, without discrimination and regularity, but with the lines of streets measured out, broad spaces left for transit, the height of the buildings limited, open areas left, and porticos added to protect the front of the clustered dwellings. These porticos Nero engaged to rear at his own expense, and then to deliver to each proprietor the areas about them cleared. He, moreover, proposed rewards proportioned to every man's rank and private substance, and fixed a day within which, if their houses, single and clustered, were finished, they should receive them. He appointed the marshes of Ostia for a receptacle of the rubbish, and that the vessels which had conveyed grain up the Tiber should return laden with rubbish that the buildings themselves should be raised a certain portion of their height without beams, and arched with stone from the quarries of Gabii or Alba, that stone being proof against fire, that over the water springs, which had been improperly intercepted by private individuals, overseers should be placed, to provide for their flowing in greater abundance, and in a greater number of places, for the supply of the public that every housekeeper should have in his yard means for extinguishing fire. Neither should there be party walls, but every house should be enclosed by its own walls. These regulations, which were favorably received in consideration of their utility, were also a source of beauty to the new city. Yet, some there were who believed that the ancient form was more conducive to health, as from the narrowness of the streets and the height of the buildings, the rays of the sun were more excluded, whereas now the spacious breadth of the streets, without any shade to protect it, was more intensely heated in warm weather. Such were the provisions made by human councils. The gods were next addressed with expiations, and recourse had to the Sibyl's books. By admonition from them, to Vulcan, Ceres, and Proserpina, supplicatory sacrifices were made, and Juno propitiated by the matrons, first in the capital, then upon the nearest shore, where, by water drawn from the sea, the temple and image of the goddess were besprinkled. The ceremony of placing the goddess in her sacred chair and her vigil were celebrated by ladies who had husbands, but not all the relief that could come from men, not all the bounties that the prince could bestow, nor all the atonements which could be presented to the gods, availed to relieve Nero from the infamy of being believed to have ordered the conflagration. Hence, to suppress the rumor, he falsely charged with the guilt and punished with the most exquisite tortures the persons commonly called Christians, who were hated for their enormities. Christus, the founder of that name, was put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out again, 
not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also, whither all things horrible and disgraceful flow from all quarters as to a common receptacle and where they are encouraged. Accordingly, first those were seized who confessed they were Christians. Next, on their information, a vast multitude were convicted, not so much on the charge of burning the city as of hating the human race. And in their deaths they were also made the subjects of sport, for they were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs, or nailed to crosses, or set fire to, and when day declined, burned to serve for nocturnal lights. Nero offered his own gardens for that spectacle, and exhibited a Circensian game, indiscriminately mingling with the common people in the habit of a charioteer, or else standing in his chariot, whence a feeling of compassion arose toward the sufferers, though guilty and deserving to be made examples of by capital punishment, because they seemed not to be cut off for the public good, but victims to the ferocity of one man. In the meantime, in order to supply money, all Italy was pillaged, the provinces ruined, both the people in alliance with us and the states which are called free. Even the gods were not exempt from plunder on this occasion, their temples in the city being despoiled, and all the gold conveyed away, which the Roman people, in every age, either in gratitude for triumphs or in fulfillment of vows, had consecrated in times of prosperity or in seasons of dismay. Through Greece and Asia, indeed, the gifts and oblations, and even the statues of the deities, were carried off.